And today we're going to continue on with our discussion on pavements. This is lecture 30 in our series. Last time we talked, we started talking about flexible pavements, asphalt pavement. Today we're going to pick up on where we left off there last time. Uh, finish up flexible pavements, talk about some concrete pavements, and then talk about how NDOT determines their pavement style and uses it. And not to say that that's, you know, the main style you're going to uh, work with in the future, but it gives you an idea of how most DOTs boil down this theory. That's the first pieces that we're going to talk about today and, and put it into practice in their system. Uh, last time we looked at what the function of pavement was, why do we even use pavement, what's, what is it really doing, what's its uh, role in the world. Talked about how to define an easel and going through an example showing an individual truck. And then we looked at, again, kind of the practical piece is you're not going to determine easels for individual trucks uh, of every single truck that drives over whatever road you're designing. You're going to probably use an average value of easels. And then how we work that into the total easels that that pavement is going to see over its lifetime. And so that's where we ended up last time is as a designer, as a highway designer, it's... Um, it's less about those the individual truck as it is, how do I apply this for my road project, which would cover every vehicle that crosses it over its lifetime. And that's where we ended up last time was calculating the lifetime easel values uh, for pavement. And remember, we only care about trucks. So if there are, are uh, more than, I would say, even 1% trucks, all we really care about is trucks, right? The cars are going to almost have uh, zero effect on the lifetime of that pavement. It's all about those weights uh, through that. So the, what we end up with is a structural number. And this is, I guess, picking it right up where we left off last time on the theory, was we're going through all the different uh, factors that plug into the that big equation, that big uh, AASHTO equation for flexible pavements uh, that was, I think, separated into three different lines. It was so long right through there. And remember, the left side of it was uh, the log of W18, which is W18 is your ESOL number. And the log of that equaled a whole bunch of stuff. And that stuff on the right also included SN, right? It included your structural number uh, piece in there, right? And what you do is you iterate through that and you find you can solve then for what your structural number is. And once that's where we, we didn't quite get to last time, once you've got that structural number, you can design your pavement now. That's really, it comes down to it is now you can just plug it in. And what this structural number uh, adds up to is there is some layer structural coefficient. So like this is your surface asphalt. You have that layer coefficient for that times your depth of that layer plus the structural coefficient of the second layer, your intermediate layer would be our second layer usually, times the depth of it and some drainage factor, right? If you've got good drainage, that's one through that. And then a third layer, and then you could keep adding on, and a fourth layer and a fifth layer, right? It's It just adds up right through there. So you add up the strength, basically the strength of all the layers of your pavement, all added together will come out to be your structural number, right? So the equation is going to tell you uh, you need a structural number of 4.5. Okay, um, what sets of layers and thicknesses and drainage coefficients do I need to get that structural number I need? Right. So that's that's what it all uh, comes down to. It all boils down to that is once you know your structural number, actually the payment design is fairly easy really you're just picking um, surface layer it's always going to be one and a half inches um, well you could go to two but all right it's almost always one and a half um, intermediate typically three to four four would be very high outside and everything else is base is you know that's roughly how we do it and then you, often there's a fourth layer in here which is aggregate underneath it and so we'll see through that the point is is that you can mix and match these layers in different depths right you could use a four inch uh, thick intermediate and only a, a three inch thick base if you wanted to or a, a three inch intermediate and a four and a half or five inch uh, thick base that's what it's going to come down to all right we'll show some examples these are what the structural layer coefficients look like this is from our our book from 252 uh, through that it just gives you a rough outline of that um hot mix asphalt hma it's got a pretty high structural coefficient right 0.44 so if we had one inch of hma you'd get 0.44 towards your goal of your total 
uh, structural number that you want, right? And then they've got a bunch of different uh, mixtures here. Um, support, Portland cement mixed in with aggregate and lime or pozzolan with aggregate, which is like a cement modified base. You know, that would be a 0.4. That's pretty good stuff, right? Here's another HMA, but this is for the base course or intermediate. I'd say you get a 0.4 out of it. For the surface course, this is HMA for a surface course. Um, it's 0.44, right? We Our surface courses are designed better and they're more expensive because of that. They have a higher structural coefficient. You could put, you could, you know, theoretically make your entire pavement out of this really good stuff that we use on the surface. Um, and you'd, you would need less of it, but it's really expensive. Um, it's it's more than 4% more expensive <laughs> than this. So that's why we don't use surface for the whole thing. And there's other reasons. It'll also, it has a really small aggregate size typically, and it's going to uh, be more prone to rutting and other problems uh, through that. So that's, I guess that's a more advanced topic uh, through there. But so this is some examples of layer coefficients. If you've got uh, stone underneath your road, you can count that as part of your structural number. And it's got a, a lower value, right? 0 0.14, 0 0.18 right? through that. Or down here, if it's... Um, if it's just sub-base crushed stone, this would be more like in-dot number 53s, that you get like a 0.11 right through there. So that's, there's just a different range of, of structural numbers. Here's some examples, right? So if we use a two inch surface course and a four inch base, we didn't use any intermediate in this case. And then some sub-base, we've got some crushed stone here. And then this is the dirt. The subgrade is just plain dirt, right? You don't get values for that. Here's our coefficients for each one of those picked off of that table we had, right? And then you just add those together. And we're gonna assume we have good drainage because we've got this nice stone under here. So that's probably gonna be pretty good drainage, right? So here's our our uh, our drainage coefficients one in both those cases. Here's this D2 is that structural coefficient there because this is not the wearing course. This is one of the base courses. And then we just got crushed stone down here, untreated crushed stone, 0.11 do that. All right, so if we added those all together, we would get it right around three. We just round that off to three. All right, through that. All right, again, uh, we're civil engineers. We're not super exact uh, on our numbers, all right? So don't don't ever report that you have a structural number of 3.03. .03. You'll be laughed at. Um, you just tell people, I've got a three, all right? And if you've got a four, or uh, sorry, a 2.97, that's good enough, right? We're going to call that a three as well uh, through there. Now, I wouldn't be more than probably 0.05 off. I would want to go high and still round down then to the three, just for it to be conservative on the design. All right through that. All right, if we want to try a different design, we could do all surface course. We just talked about. Let's do seven inches of surface course. All right, we'll plug that in. Also get a three. Right, 3.08. We just call that a three. All right through there. So both of these, both of these designs are going to give you the same structural number. They theoretically, according to that equation will have the same life, uh, the same life expectancy. They can handle as much traffic and live just as long as the other pavement. They're both a structural number of three. And so that's once you get that structural number going through that big ASHTO equation, this is what you do. You, you pick out what your layers are going to be and you drop them in, right? So it could be that. But, and we're not suggesting this is, this is not a uh, true design. I would not try that. There's other problems with using all surface cores, which we just mentioned, right? The point is, is that these are equivalent pavements, right? Those are basically the same, uh, st by structures, they're the same pavement. And yeah, we aren't probably aren't gonna be this, this was a dramatic uh, uh, example. So we probably wouldn't be this dramatic, but you could definitely make this one and a half and three and six, something like that. You know, whatever adds up to three, basically, is gonna be fine. Do there. You can add some uh, geotextile down here. That'll give you a little bit boost. That'll give you, they say that's equivalent to four to six inches of aggregate if you put some geotextile in here, according to the manufacturers of geotextile. I'm not sure if that's uh, independently proven or not uh, through there. But there's a lot of ways to get that structural number, and that's what it all just comes down to. You, just, you have to get whatever structural number the equation told you you needed. All right, through there. Just to recap, this is how that fl flexible pavement process worked through there. You may remember this from last year is the first thing we need to do is how many easels are we designing for, right? And that's all just based off truck traffic. And we've been through that at the end of the last time's lecture. You can uh, rewind back to that and see how that worked right through there. The other things you need to know are um, 
what's your final rating? What's your final um, pavement serviceability index, right? We start at five and we drop down to what well, could go to zero, I guess is just plain dirt. Um, five is a brand new pavement. And usually our terminal, where we end, where we say our pavement is done, it's either a 2 or 2.5, right? We'd use a 2.5 if it was a more important road. If it was a freeway or an interstate, we would use 2.5. If it's a little uh, city street or a county road, we'd probably use a 2, not 2 there. How reliable does it need to be? Right, if this is a really important road, you're going to want high reliability. If you want high reliability, guess what happens to your structural number? Right? It goes up. So that's that's what this. If uh, if you're going to have a if you want to handle uh, 30 million easels and have the pavement uh, survive 30 million easels and end up at 2.5, guess what? It's going to have a higher structural number than if it went to a two. Right. All right so it has to be a little bit stronger to. Uh, survive 30 million easels and still end at 2.5. If you want it to be more reliable, the structural number is going to go up, right? If the soil strength, if you've got a lower soil strength, guess what happens to the structural number? Right? It goes up. I think you see this. <laughs> Which way we're going here, right? If you've got a strong soil, you can get by with a thinner pavement, right? You don't need to dissipate as much uh, of the force, of the weight coming through that pavement as you would if you've got a weak soil, right? If you're on weak soils, you're going to need a thicker pavement to distribute the load more, right, through that. All right, and then finally, you you calculate what your structural number is, and and then back here, to calculate easels, you had to assume a structural number to get that easel uh, calculation done, and then you see, does it match? Well, if my structural number is a little bit off, if my structural number came out at 3.5 and I had assumed it was uh, 2, then I've got to reiterate. All right, I've got to try a higher structural number up here, probably 3, iterate again and see if they get close. And you keep iterating until they match. Do that. So that's flexible pavements. Now we're moving into rigid pavements. This is the concrete pavement right through here. This uh, just go over some terminology so you know what we're talking about uh, through this. We call uh, Portland cement concrete is PCC, typically what we call it uh, through there. So you'll often see that as abbreviated, uh, just PCC. You'll see that in the um, uh, the uh, cost calculations. You can get a, a, a bid tabs from a construction project and they'll list usually they do these abbreviations so if you see this it's portland cement concrete which is the white stuff right uh, through there and the, the difference is we're using portland cement instead of asphalt to stick rocks together so that's our two pavement <laughs> types right and so the the black stuff is using asphalt uh, oil basically um, slightly modified oil or i guess nowadays it's more modified but it's modified oil um, to stick rocks together and if and in portland cement concrete we're using portland cement which is made out of limestone baked limestone basically to stick rocks together all right so those are our, there those are our, our two um, cements and so sometimes uh, in the old days the hma they used to sometimes call it ac you know asphaltic cement um, pavement ACP and so forth. We don't typically use that term any, much anymore, but they, sometimes you'll still see that AC is asphaltic cement, right? Versus Portland cement. So both of them are cement. Both of them are a, a, form, a way to stick rocks together is what it really comes down to, right? Um, how they act is very different, uh, but still, uh, we're still sticking rocks together. <laughs> That's right. So the, the by, by volume, the main the main thing in both kinds of pavement is rock. <laughs> and so uh, are the properties of those aggregates, we technically call them aggregates, the properties of those aggregates is really what gives a lot of strength uh, to the to the pavements. Not all of it though. Um, so also a lot of it is what percentage is the paste and um, different properties of the chemical. In, in Portland cement, it's a lot about the chemical properties of that Portland cement, right? And how it, it joins things or doesn't, air entrainment, all that stuff that you've probably learned about in your materials class, right, through there. So we've got different kinds of Portland cement concrete pavements we call rigid pavement types right we've got uh, the jointed plane concrete uh, jointed reinforced continually reinforced and pre-stressed uh, concrete pavements right through there and uh, there's almost always some kind of a base underneath it we rarely just pour this straight onto the subgrade onto on well uh, the natural occurring ground, right? Even if we did, we would roll the ground and we could compress it and uh, consolidate it as much as possible first through there. But it would have to be a pretty good one to not have any uh, 
um, any aggregate place underneath it. And that's what we I think we've learned over time is is pouring right on to the the uh, uh, untreated ground is not a great idea. It's definitely always better to throw some aggregate underneath. Uh, just if nothing else, it's your security blanket. If you've got, it's mostly for drainage, right? The you know, main thing is to get that drainage wicked away from the bottom of the pavement and drain out, right? If you're on top, if, you know, if you've got a pretty good sandy soil, maybe you can just pave right on top of it. Other than that, I'd say you're going to almost always put some kind of a base down through there. So let's go through these, uh, show some examples of each one through that. This is jointed plain concrete pavement. And so we're looking down at the road, right? Here's one lane. Here's, assume this is like US 30 out there. We've got two lanes going in one direction. One, this is our A lane, our B lane right through that. And these are the concrete panels or these darker lines right, through there. So just like the sidewalk out by uh, the school here, right, we've always got joints in it because concrete pavement needs joints, right? Asphaltic concrete uh, is flexible, and so we don't need to put the joints into it. And rigid pavements, we do have to put joints in, right? And this is jointed plain concrete pavement. So there is uh, minimal rebar inside these panels, right? Either none or just enough for thermal uh, uh, to retain the thermal contraction, keep it from cracking due to thermal loads, right? And then there's an, another kind of paper we're going to talk about in a second, which is truly reinforced, structurally reinforced, right, through there. So there, there may be, there may just be putting the, the wire down in this, you know, the little wire mesh in here. Uh, just for the thermal contraction and keeping that together. Other than that, it's not technically reinforced beyond that point. Now, we often put dowels across between the slabs. Oops. So these are the dowels uh, connecting these two slabs together, and sometimes we'd put them here too. All right. In fact, we almost always do now. But this would be considered a plain concrete pavement because there is no uh, reinforcement, no structural reinforcement inside the slab either none or no structural reinforcement, right? So jointed reinforced concrete pavement is we've got um, wire fabric or we've, or even the original ones had, you know, straight up dowel bars. It was designed like a bridge deck almost um, through there. Um, I'm not, sorry, not dowel bars, but just uh, regular reinforcement put in um, back in the 60s when they were first trying reinforced concrete pavements. And it's, it's reinforced enough that it's um, it's a structural reinforcement, right? And that's part of, and so you can use less depth if you're putting in reinforcement. That's the the goal in a uh, jointed reinforced concrete pavement. And in a plain concrete pavement, even if you may have some wire fabric in there for thermal expansion uh, control, you don't, you're not calculating any part, you're not reducing the depth of the of the plain concrete at all uh, to take into account that you've got reinforcement. In this case, you're counting on the reinforcement to actually uh, move some of the load and spread the load around for you. All right through there. In these cases, um, again, you'd probably dowel the joints. They tried this without doweling the joints, and it turns out turns out to be technically a bad. Uh, uh, bad way to do it. The dowels, what they do is they're transferring load from one slab into the next slab. All right. And so the other thing that you can see the difference on here, jointed plane, you've got 15 to 30 foot spacings between these joints. All right. On a reinforced concrete one, you've got a longer spacing between the joints because you've got this reinforcement in here uh, holding it all together and being a structural uh, piece. Doweling across between slabs, either in the same lane or across lanes, is transferring load so that the, this whole area acts together and doesn't act independently. And that's better. Right? You're spreading your load across between the different slabs. That spreads it out even further and it's, it's better. Uh, better load management through there. Continuously reinforced uh, concrete. I-65, a lot of this back in the 60s when it was first built, was continuous reinforcement. And they didn't put any joints in. They just said, well, it is strong enough with all this reinforcement we've got in here um, that it can handle itself and will be fine, right, for whichever lane you're in. Through that, well, it turned out that doesn't really work that well. Uh, we still use it occasionally um, where it's needed to you. Uh, to use reinforced slabs like this, it's uh, NDOT has given up trying it on main line, as far as I know. Um, so it's um, I saw some pictures from the original I-65. It didn't it didn't last well. It did not age well at all um, doing it continuously reinforced. Right. I think the thermal properties was just too much for it uh, over time, and it 
kind of pulls itself apart right, through there. Pre-stressed concrete paving. I don't know if you've looked at pre-stressing in your structures classes. Any like pre-stressed bridge decks are very common. Uh, uh, pre-stressed and uh, beams uh, if by in dot are also very common, right? That you you put these wire strands in here and you jack them uh, during the construction, and that that provides uh, compression through the. Not the structure in this case, this would be our pavement is is being compressed on either through that, and that's uh, holding it together, right? And it's a form of you know reinforcement through that. So that's pre-stressed concrete pavement. It's again, um, this is more expensive. That's the downside of using pre-stressing uh, for this. And you can just imagine um, stressing these strands before you put load on, right? You have to pour the concrete; it has to cure, and then you put tension on it. Uh, on these strands and which puts compression into the into the concrete uh, structure through that so that pre-stressing you, you know that just sounds harder right <laughs> you're, you know you're you have to come back you've got to you've got to uh, do all that uh, pre-stressing work on it all right here's the rigid formula it looks a lot oh it looks really long and it has some of the same terms as we had in the flexible uh, equation and this this log w18 is you know it's over here on the left side of the equation uh, sign through that again w18 is still easel value now the difference is we do calculate easels differently from a rigid pavement than we did on the asphalt uh, pavement or flexible pavement through there but it's still the same idea here's our easel value uh, through that even though we use a different table to calculate easels and then this is a big long equation for the concrete slab through that right so these are the terms we had before that we had to plug into the flexible pavement. Here's the special terms in red that are new to for uh, concrete pavement. All right. So this is a slightly different calculation, a way to calculate the easels, and so we're we're putting that into the red highlighting area here. All right now we've it's a totally different material properties because we're using Portland cement concrete, and so we've got the the modulus of rupture. We've got a drainage coefficient. Uh, we weren't as keen on that with the, uh, the flexible. It wasn't part of the main equation, uh, but it becomes part of it in uh, this rigid pavement because it's more sensitive to that. Uh, pumping is our main problem. Uh, with especially near the edges of the slabs right that'll be a big problem uh, and cause failure of the whole pavement structure eventually load transfer this is if you have dowels or whether you don't have dowels between the two slabs that's the term j that's so we're, we're working through this equation basically right so you can pick out here's this j term that's whether you have dowels or not right uh, through there and that's that load transfer. We've got the modulus of elasticity for the concrete, and then we have the sublet grade reaction, uh, which is K, right? And it's a different term than we use for the, the soil strength in the flexible pavement one through there. Just a comparison, again, the way we calculate easels is differently. Um, and this is that same truck we were looking at before. Remember, we had a triple axle back here, double axle, and a single axle, and a steer axle. And so if you use the rigid uh, easel values, you're going to get 2.7 versus 1.6. Right, so that's quite a bit of difference on this particular truck uh, and how it works. Sometimes there's not that big of a difference. It's not usually quite this drastic uh, through there. Just the, the difference is, and people ask me, well, why does... Um, why would there be a difference in in the easels? It's uh, it's a dynamic it's a dynamic problem, right? So the the weight of the truck on those axles is having an effect on the pavement, and the, the pavement reacts. And it and uh, with a flexible pavement, right? It's it's all it's like a more like a mattress. It's a little softer feel. <laughs> I don't know. Um, asphalt's technically a, a liquid. You could. Uh, Determine as a liquid as a pavement, right? It'll flow, it'll move right through there less in the winter than it does in the summer, but it's still, it, it's always got some flexibility in it. That's how we design it, right? Rigid pavement has none. And so you can just think about when you um, uh, hit a bridge deck as you're coming across with your car, right? There's a hard bump a lot of times right through there, right? You wouldn't get that on an asphalt road. And that that creates more of a dynamic force from the weight of your vehicle. You're transferring um, a little bit of a dynamic force also into the pavement, which you don't get that much of in asphalt pavement. Even if you've got a bunch of cracks in the asphalt, it's not likely that you're going to have that because it's, it's, um, 
that tra that whole pavement's going to flow and keep either side of that crack even uh, through there. Concrete, not necessarily, and being so rigid, it, it's more like a resonance almost within the structure. Right? It it feels those dynamic effects more, and so that's that's one of the reasons. Uh, in I think is why we calculate easels differently for both. And that's again the really the what they did was they drove eighteen thousand pound axle loads across a whole bunch of concrete pavement. Then they drove something heavier, something lighter, and they checked how much damage the heavier and the lighter axles did compared to the to the eighteen thousand pound one. Right? And and so these are. Um, these were actually field verified, right? These are these are field numbers. This isn't a theory. Uh, we've we've because uh, it came out in the '60s. Well, now we do have pretty good computer models that can can model these these interactions. They didn't then, right? So these were actually field tested numbers, and so they said, well, a 34,000 pound axle compared to an 18,000 pound axle is, um, and this is a triple axle, is doing 0.59 times the damage. A 34,000 pound double, this was the tandem axle on that truck, right, is doing 1.95 times as much damage as uh, a single 18,000 pound axle, right? Whereas on the asphalt, it only did 1.11 times as much damage. Right, so you can see these are higher, and it's I I think it's that resonance effect. Right now, when you get lighter, like the twelve thousand pound one, the rigid actually feels it less. Right, but as you go above it, so they're very different curves in how the weight affects you know, the long term viability of that pavement. And so we've got different easel values. So very long discussion about why the easel numbers are different. But I've been asked that before, and it's hard. You can't ask me now. So I'm just throwing it in there as a bonus. You can, you know, hey, this is a, a video. You can skip all that, right, if you get bored. So uh, kind of the modulus of rupture, you should understand that from your materials class. The drainage coefficient, um, if you've got good drainage, these are under drains. These are letting water out from the base layer underneath the road and into this ditch, right? Ideally, we wouldn't want this water up to that. <laughs> we want it down below it a little bit to make sure that's free draining. Uh, but still, having under drains in place and having it designed with under drains from the get-go probably means we're going to use a 1.0 for good drainage. All right, through there, if we've got nothing planned for drainage and we're just putting the pavement in uh, nothing special planned for it we're going to use something less than one uh, for that this is that load transfer coefficient this is that term j right uh, through there if we do have dowel bars in our pavement we're going to use a 3.2 factor for that that j term right and this is this is what the dowels look like half of them is in the slab over here and this is the other half sticking out and so you're going to pave the next panel Right, and so this this will be embedded in the next panel. All right, here is this they've drilled for the dowels. They're about to insert the dowels into it. After they insert it, it looks like that. All right, so here's this is a bridge approach slab, but they're dowling it in as well uh, through there. All right, uh, here's that modulus of elasticity. You should understand that. Right, if we want to stay in the elastic range, we'd better be in the elastic range, or our payment will not last long at all <laughs> if we. Uh, if we don't stay in the elastic range in that. So we're down in there, the modulus of elasticity. Here's our subgrade reaction. You can still start with that CBR value, right? And then this is the equivalent uh, modulus uh, for concrete pavement over here. So we just use a table to solve in this case. But again, if your soil re soils report gives you a CBR value, you can convert it, right, into how many uh, pounds per cubic inch of uh, this modulus you've got. Uh, for that, right? Then the main problem with this equation is you've got this D in here four different times, right? That's the depth, that's the slab depth of your concrete pavement, right? Through that, right? How do you solve? How do you solve an equation that's got the same variable in it in four different places and it's hairy, right? This is a hairy equation. This is a log. This is in the denominator. This one's got it in the numerator and the denominator raised to a power, right? So it's again, it's going to be iteration, right? We're gonna we're gonna assume a d. We're gonna calculate everything, and we're gonna find out if that is true. And if it's not, we just iterate and we iterate again, right? Again, uh, Excel will be your best friend if you ever have to do this in real life. Uh, through that, right? And so now, so that's the the main, that's the general stuff, right? How does N dot do it? Right. So here's some. The next few slides are all about how N dot works, their magic, and so this is this is their standard, right? So N dot is is a believer in the plain concrete uh, with joint reinforcement and tie bars. So they do dowel bars uh, through there. 
and they but they like plain concrete, right? They're not going to use rarely will they use continuous reinforcement or pre-stressed or um, reinforced concrete um, pavements. They have over the years decided that the jointed plane with uh, dowel bars is their preferred method. So this is this is a standard in dot one. This is in this case here's our our travel lanes going this direction. Here's a shoulder, so even the shoulder is paved. And if you've got a shoulder, dowel in, because now you can use this area uh, to dissipate some of the weight, right? So this may be your main truck lane next to the shoulder. That's normally where the trucks tend to be in the right lane if it's a two-lane road. And so they're going to definitely be, you know, their wheels are within a foot of that edge of pavement of the travel lane. So if you dowel across, you can use the shoulder to also dissipate that, that load. And that's what INDOT likes to do. Their panel spacings are 15 to 18 feet. These lanes are 12 feet wide, almost always. The shoulder is probably, you know, the concrete portion of it uh, depends on the classification of the road, but it could be as big as 10 feet wide over there, but it could be as small as two uh, over that. All right, so that's, this is, the again, how uh, INDOT likes to do theirs on there. Here's some examples from INDOT. So this is getting ready to pave. Here's the dowel bars. All right here's from the last slab. You can see them sticking out. Here's from the adjoining lane. They've also got tied across, right, so that you can get load transfer in all directions across all the joints, right. And the way they do this in practice for for speed is, you know, they're going to use a slip form paper to do this. They lay all where these joints out all in advance, and they line up all these. Uh, uh, dowel bars, and they've got these these spacer uh, bar arrangements with it that put them in place, and now you just pave right over the top of this, and you don't have to stop. And then you'll come back later and with a saw, and you'll saw cut right over the, the center of all these dowels, so you better not forget where they were. All right, so you'll come back and you saw cut, so that's that forms that that joint then all right, through there. And there's, there's rules on how deep the saw cut has to be to uh, uh, to work properly, right? You don't want it too deep, but you need to be deep enough to make sure it cracks where you want it to crack. Um, and then these dowel bars will transfer the load, right, through that. And these are epoxy coated and everything, so they can handle the environment better. So this is how it looks right before you pave, right, before the paver comes through and gets going right, through that. So for for the flexible, you get that structural number. Then you specify out your layer depths and you use times your coefficients for that until you uh, you achieve the structural number a little bit better than that usually. And in the rigid, you're you're gonna iterate forever, <laughs> it may seem, until you get D, which is the depth of slab. And so for a jointed plane concrete pavement. You know, you've got the whatever terms in that equation, and you'll find out, okay, I need a 10 inch or 11 inch or 12 inch depth for my concrete pavement. And that's how you work through that, All right? And that's gonna is a big fan of plain jointed. All right, through there. They will use the other sometimes. Pre stress tends to be just at airports, uh, that's where it's mostly used um, through there because you know, it's, it's a smaller, uh, you know, a runway is. Um, it's a limited length, right? Even though they're fairly long, they can be 10,000 feet long. It's still a, f a fairly limited length by road standards, right? Which is often measured in 20 or 30 miles in a paving project, right? Through there. So pre-stressing those makes more sense. And that extra load where the, the touchdown point for the uh, aircraft is, um, you know, that can be a, kind of a higher dynamic load, depends on how well the pilot comes in, right? Uh, through there, so they, they, you can, it's used there, and that's, that's the most place it's used as an airfield design, right? INDOT has used, uh, they showed an example where they've used reinforced concrete where they needed to save depth, right? They were trying to retrofit a road and get more clearance underneath a bridge. They had an overpass, an older one through there that was below the recommended uh, clearance height. It was legal, but it was low enough that it kept getting hit by trucks. So they, um, the jointed, the plane jointed, you know, resulted in maybe a, it would have been a 13 inch thick slab using reinforced concrete. Maybe it was a 10 inch or something. Right? So they saved some inches of pavement by using reinforcement. And so they did that. And then it was worth it to them to use a reinforced concrete slabs uh, in that place, even though they're more expensive uh, and, um, and so forth. So that's, uh, those are all different tools in the toolbox. This is the one in that generally likes uh, the most, right? And so the 
it, now we're into the reality slides. Yeah, you can go through and design payments by hand. And actually, the, those terms are super useful to know because you will need them. But really, the way every designs, well, INDOT designs everything now is it was with special software. And so actually, ASHTO, same people who made those equations, write their own software, right? So that you can, um, it just plugs everything in for you. But it's going to ask you all those terms we just went through, your reliability, your PSI, your all that stuff, right, are inputs into that software. So that's why we've been talking about it, is you now you know what these things are, uh, so you can plug it into the software, right. And, and what they generally use now, they call it a mechanistic empirical um, equation. The old equation uh, used to be the Marshall uh, test method was basically all empirical, which means it was just based off experience. And so they, they did all those road tests and that came out, uh, the original equations were through that. Mechanistic empirical means now the mechanistic part is they've done like, I think, generally finite element analysis on pavements. And so they they understand the theory of how the pavement is working better than they used to, and they can kind of combine them. And so that's the mechanistic empirical method, right? Really, the inputs are the fairly almost exactly the same. <laughs> I can tell you a, a few of the the new ones are more related to special asphalts we have now that we didn't have back then, right? Through their in asphalt properties, is one of the I know new things that's in the in the program uh, that we didn't have to that weren't in those original equations uh, through that and we, and we and you have to do um, uh, more dynamic testing and so forth now than you used to uh, to get your pavements uh, designed properly right, through there so that's but that's where we're coming from and that's why we went over all those terms is because we still use that stuff right even though you're yeah if you're going to design payments for indot you have to take uh, you have to pass a special class and then you're going to have to buy a ten thousand dollar piece of software and use that um and to design their payments and they're going to review it and they'll still tell you you're wrong you have to do it twice but anyway um that's how uh, that's how it's really working in in the real world here's some of their inputs from the indot design manual for for pavements and and one of the things, you know, you're, that sets up how deep your pavement needs to be, that's really it, by structural number or by D or depth for, for rigid, is how long you expect it to last, right? That's going to make a big difference right, through there. And you can see here's what INDOT says is the, uh, what's your design life you're supposed to plan on, right, for that. Now, do these pavements really survive this long? You know, that's always been a, a question, right? So the... You know, back when I was still a designer, they used to, I think they still back then said, oh yeah, Portland cement concrete has got a 30 year design life and HMA is, is 20. And what it really turns out is Portland cement concrete lasts about 20 years and maybe your HMA lasts 15. And so <laughs> neither one of these numbers we ever thought was that accurate <laughs> right through there. But that's your goal. This would be your goal <laughs> number. So we'll leave it with that. So that's, this is what you're supposed to be plugging into your your uh in this case your software this is what your design life is going to be right now if you pick a lower design life you're going to go uh, less of a depth or a lower structural number right for your payments so that's how that's that affects that's why these numbers are important right for what you're expecting right and it's also this for life cycle analysis this is important to to know what you expect now i yeah i just can't believe anyone truly thinks any pavement's going to last 50 years, but that's my personal opinion. All right, INDOT can say anything they want uh, on there. The And we went through all that hassle last time about calculating the total easels that are going to travel over your design lane in uh, the life of the pavement. Right, that was the big uh, input value, right? Well, it pops into this, in these tables through here, and in that, they kind of make it easy for you. This is your average annual daily truck traffic, so just count trucks, because guess what? Cars don't matter. I think we've mentioned that before. Um, so if you know how many trucks you have per day, right, then this puts you, they up, I've already calculated it for you, right? For a two-lane road, this is your easel range, and this is the category of pavement you're going to use. So a two is a, a lower rated uh, HMA pavement. has lower design standards, and that's the actual pavement design, like the mix design kind of. The how much asphalt, what kind of aggregate, and how much aggregate, and all that stuff, right, goes in there. This isn't that strong of a pavement. This is a better pavement. This is a really good pavement, right? 
uh, through that. And that's all based off this, this average annual daily truck traffic right, number through there, which can convert to easels. All right, we calculated easels last time. You could jump into this chart right in here. Right? And then you can pick out which category you're going to use. And then they've got a whole set of specs all about uh, each of these categories and what it means and, and what the reliability of the actual asphalt has to be, the, the mix has to be the HMA. Uh, for that based on that category number. So that's how they're using it. Um, QCQA is quality control quality assurance. This is their best pavement, right? This is high quality mainline pavement that you would use on state routes or interstates or anything uh, through that, right? So this is the good stuff. Right? They have for smaller quantities, if you're doing side roads and if you're doing driveways and stuff, there's a different category that's not QCQA. The, the difference is, is that QCQA has a lot more testing even after you've placed it. You've got to, um, you got to pull plates and do cores and everything and test it after it's in place and been compacted and through that to, to assure in dot, that's the assurance part, that it is good quality stuff and was properly placed. Placed, right and so that's it's a much more of a hassle for a contractor but on a big project it you know fits right in it's fine you're used to it right you've got an inspector there anyway pulling plates and doing everything anyway uh, through that for small projects this would be a real hassle for you know for a one-day paving project to, to have to pull plates and do all this extra testing for QCQA so they have a different standard uh, for low volume and low tonnage uh, projects this is the good stuff Right, so that's QCQA, long, long story there. Here's an example um, from the NDOT. This is their, uh, their quantity uh, list. And so when you're listing things like we saw in those typical sections before, this is how you'd write it out. This is QCQA HMA 476 surface 9.5 millimeters. That's what you'd actually write on the plan sheet. Right, and, should, and in front of it, you'd say it's 165 pounds per square yard, or 110 pounds per square yard, or whatever, uh, which you know equates to depth. Uh, but this is their pay quantity. This is this is their pay uh, category, I guess, uh, through there. And then you, uh, and when you're doing your quantities, you'd calculate how much of this mix you've got, right? And this is from uh, last year, so this is Indot's um, unit bid prices based on that. And so the way it's, this is the high quality stuff. So it's QCQA HMA right through there. So we know, okay, it's, this is a different standard uh, stuff. Here's the standard number, which is how you look it up in a standard um, standards uh, you know, book from NDOT. So you know how to, uh, you can read this section 401 and find out exactly what this means, right? Four is that traffic category. That's this guy, right? And it's just based on how much traffic there was, right? 76 is your highest expected surface temperature in the summer uh, on the pavement, and it's in Celsius, um, as I recall. Mm, something like that, yeah. Um, so the, um, and so this, and it's by region is typically how they, they look at it. So this would be probably in southern Indiana, you'd use 76, and in central 70, and then in some places 64. I don't think this one's, these are, aren't used that often through there. I think it's mostly 70s and 76s is, is what they, they tell you to use for that, All right? Through there, what kind of a mix is, is it surface, right? There's also intermediates, and then this is the top of top aggregate size. And so this is 9.5 millimeters, this is quarter inch aggregate. All right, so these are these are standard surface mixes with small aggregate in it. So it's a nice, uh, a very tight one um, fit. All right, as you can see, that one thing I wanted to point out here is this is a, a 476. So this is, 76 is going to jump your price up a lot because that's uh, what this means is that it has to be stable up to a higher temperature. Right, you're expecting a higher temperature, surface temperature, when the sun is shining on this pavement, and it's 100. And the ambient temperature is 100 degrees outside. Right, you're, um, you know, you see news anchors sometimes do this. They, you know, they'll fry an egg on the asphalt because it's so hot. Right, your pavement temperature because it's black is is going to be way higher than exactly what your surface, your ambient temperature is. That's why this number is so high. Uh, through there, if you want your pavement to be stable still and not be too soft and rut, you um, that's you set that with this number right. This one, if it gets really hot, is not going to be as stable as the 76. You can see the difference in the price. You know, look at this 376 versus this 370. Um, well, it's actually cheaper. Hmm, okay, take that back. Um, <laughs> so. Um, it should be more expensive to, to get 76 uh, through there than it is to have the uh, uh, 
70. The, the difference is probably quantity. And that's, if you've got a really big project and it's all using 70, you're going to get better prices. And so you'll actually see the price be lower. So we'll call that. The the number here, three and four, that's how much traffic you've got. All right, you can see there is a big difference there. See, I proved something right today. There is a big difference um, to be able to handle that much more traffic, this higher classification for traffic, it costs a lot more money. And that's, um, yeah, to, to have a better product it's going to cost you more so it's 115 dollars a ton uh, is basically what that's coming out to be and i can uh, over here this is the this is their full listing from that and you can download this from the in.website. website you, know, you can see here here's the surface here's our intermediates through there and you can kind of see the range in prices we've got all right so let's pick a, a class two surface 70 so here's our class two surface 70. It's about $86. What's our class two surface 70? It's about $60, right? So it's much cheaper. Oh, that's still surface. What's intermediate? Class two 70 intermediate, $71, right? And then down here are your bases. And so if we had a class two I don't have many class twos, do they? And they're all 64. So base bases don't get as hot, so you don't you're not going to see the 76 down here. So you're going to see the 64, right? And so bases are generally going to be running cheaper. Again, it depends on the quantity. Look at this guy, $250. <coughs> this this must have only been used like one place. <laughs> it was a small quantity, so the price is super high. So the, and these are weighted averages through that. So that's um, just throwing out. This is section 401 or asphalt pavements all the asphalt pavements you've got all these other asphalt items right through here anything you want to do uh, crack sealing prime coating tack coating here's all those prices here's your portland cement concrete pavement all right so the pccp 10 inch thick 11 inch thick 12 inch thick 13 inch per square yard now and so there's our prices per square yard Right through there temperature doesn't really fit into it on this right and it must have not been much 14 inch because it's really expensive you know it's twice what these others are through there but you can see adding an inch of pavement jumps your price up quite a bit uh, through that right through there so there's and these are all the 501s are your Portland cement concrete pavements and 502s these are the high quality ones uh, quality control quality assurance here's your standard ones all right through there um and there's probably just a lot less of these because of almost everything is QCQA uh, these days. All right. So this is this is how it works uh, with the N.1. And you can find prices for most anything through that. I just want to show you all the different options here are um, within that. Move this back over here. All right. Um, and so that's, this is how this, this breaks down. And so that's, uh, again, kind of bringing this down to the level of, of how you'd actually use this as a designer when you become a you become a consultant or go to work for NDOT. Uh, through there, this is how they're going to specify everything. And hopefully you understand now that a little bit of the background of what goes into the pavement design process. Um, through that, obviously, you know, you can spend weeks uh, learning about the details and learn how to use a special program and all that through here. But this hopefully is a good starter course uh, in looking at that. All right.